Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Crystal Des Del Rosso and I am from NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm an education coordinator uh, that works on the NASA SUITS activity. And so SUITS stands for Space User Interface Technologies for Students. And today we uh, are bringing to you a very special presentation from Mr. Chris, Chris Hansen about the EVA 23 uh, incident. And so I'm going to go on. We've got one thing that we need to take care of prior to um, uh, going into the presentation. And so today we have add closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can see um, a CC button. You can turn that on to have closed captioning. You also can change the language from English to Spanish in that cl closed captioning if, if you need to. And so that's a little housekeeping before I turn it over to my activity manager, Brandon Hargis. Yes, and I would like to uh, welcome everyone to our presentation today, and I'd like to also introduce our presenter. Uh, Mr. Chris Hansen with NASA Johnson Space Center is the manager for the Extravehicular Activity Office. Mr. Hansen joined NASA at Johnson Space Center as a cooperative education student in 1991, where he worked on several projects as a structural analyst and designer. After graduating from the University of California at Irvine in 1993 with a degree in mechanical engineering, he joined NASA full-time where he worked as a structural analyst. In 1999, Mr. Hansen earned a Master's of Medical Engineering degree from Rice University. In 2007, Mr. Hansen became the Chief Engineer for the International Space Station, leading a talented team of technical experts dedicated to flying the International Space Station safely and successfully. In, in mid-2013, Mr. Hansen served as a chairman of the Mishap Investigation Board, which was appointed to investigate a dangerous incident that occurred during a spacewalk on board the International Space Station when water began flooding into the astronaut's spacesuit helmet. In 2014, Mr. Hansen was named as the Chief of the Crew and Thermal Systems Division, which is responsible for the design and engineering of all of NASA's spacesuits, life support systems, and man-rated thermal vacuum chambers. In 2015, he became the manager of the EVA office responsible for integrating all the spacewalking activities for NASA. He grew up in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And without further ado, I'd like to turn over the program to Mr. Chris Hansen. Hey, Brandon. Thanks a bunch for the introduction. So first, as we get started here, there's two quick shout outs I want to give. Um, the Your Suit team, Suits team, Brandon, you got a group of really smart university kids out there from around the country that are helping us design the informatics systems for the next generation spacesuits. And also like to give a quick shout out to the Villanova engineering department. My daughter's a freshman mechanical engineering student there. So hopefully some of her peeps made it on this as well. So shout out to you guys out of Villanova. So first question is why are we here? Other than the fact that we've all been locked in our houses for the last two months and are bored and looking for stuff to talk about. Um, outside of that, we picked this subject because it's it's a subject I'm very passionate about. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about why. So most of you who know NASA's history uh, know we have a bit of a tragic history. If we go back to the Apollo 1 program, the Apollo 1 fire where we lost three astronauts, the Challenger accident uh, where we lost seven, and the Columbia accident where we lost seven more. Um, those were really, really painful lessons for us to learn as an agency. Um, but we use those as learning experiences. One of the, the issues, though, that as we started investigating this particular incident, we noticed that there were some echoes of the same problems that led, that contributed at least to those earlier accidents. We heard them, you know, we saw signs of them continuing. So we asked ourselves, why was that? Um, and we wanted to dig into that a little bit. And, and the answer we, we got to was that um, the way we learn things is by experiencing them. I've got a, a whole shelf full of lessons learned books. I can't claim that I've read all of them because it's not the way that people learn. We learn by experiencing things and by understanding that there are people at the center of all these tragedies. They're not just astronauts, they're people. Um, they're, they have families, mothers and fathers and children and brothers and sisters who care a lot about them. Um, and so the administrator at the time of NASA, Charlie Bolden, um, challenged me to go out and talk about this incident um, so that we could try to remember what happened and take the lessons learned from them and do our best not to repeat them. 
Uh, Bill Gerstenmaier, who was the head of the human spaceflight program at NASA during this time, um, called this a gift. Um, our, PA, our PAO folks didn't like that a lot, but, but he's right. And what he meant, he wasn't happy that it happened, but, but it was a gift in that, in this incident that we're gonna talk about, um, nobody was hurt and nobody was killed. And yet it was a serious enough event to make us look at ourselves and ask ourselves, how can we be better at what we do? Um, so the idea here is to let you see firsthand, to listen and to feel and to hear what happened um, in this event. And what I wanna remind you guys, there's a lot of, I'm assuming young engineers listening here and a lot of other folks that when you do your job, there are lives at stake. And it's not just the engineers, it's the technicians that work at chemical plants, it's pilots, it's bus drivers, it's Uber drivers, it's you every time you get behind the wheel of a car. There are people's lives at stake. And you need to remember that those are real people and you have a responsibility to help keep them safe. And that's really <clears throat> what we're gonna talk about here today. To remind you of some things to think about that hopefully um, will let you do your job in a, in a safer way and help keep the people that we all love alive. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about the EVA 23 close call. What happened? The good news is we, um, a couple of years ago, we made a short little documentary movie that will tell you kind of the what happened. And I'll go in and talk about sort of the why it happened and what we learned from talking about the EVA 22 that happened a week before. Some key findings. We'll talk a little bit about the recovery team, sort of what we did in the immediate aftermath of this particular event. We'll talk about some of the hardware findings, why did the suit fail, and lessons learned that I hope that you guys can apply um, to your lives and your jobs as we go forward. So let's go to the next slide. So let's talk about the event. So the event occurred um, on the morning of July 16th in 2013. I was actually with my family at Yosemite National Park at the time. Uh, when I got a text message that um, we had an EVA that was terminated early, not a big deal. They came in, everybody was fine, not a problem. But as we dug into it, we realized that the event was a lot more serious. This happened on board the International Space Station during US EVA 23, which means it was the 23rd stage EVA that was performed for the International Space Station. About 44 minutes into that EVA, ESA, the European Space Agency astronaut Luca Parmitano, reported water inside his helmet on the back of his head. The ground team, Luca, and his partner, Chris Cassidy, who's currently on board the International Space Station today, were unable to identify the water source. And as they continued to work, the amount of water increased in Luca's helmet and eventually migrated from the back of his head onto his face. That EVA was terminated and the crew, both uh, Chris and Luca, were brought back inside safely. Um, but what started out as a very normal EVA, EVA became one of the most serious mishaps in the history of spacewalking. Good news, it was also one of the best documented mishaps ever. Um, so we're gonna show it to you. So with that, let's go watch the movie. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavor with the first American element of the International Space Station uniting our efforts in space to achieve our common goal. In 1998, work began on the world's most important scientific laboratory, the International Space Station. That work involved thousands of hours of design, testing, and wrench turning manual labor. Because it was assembled for the first time in space, an area we call low Earth orbit, the astronauts had to don the iconic white spacesuit called the EMU, which stands for Extravehicular Mobility Unit. In these spaceships for one, astronauts are able to work safely and comfortably in the most hostile environment known to humankind. Usually in pairs, astronauts exit the airlock of the ISS in order to begin what we call extravehicular activities, or EVAs. 
Most EVAs typically last about seven hours, have been simulated several times, and involve slow, deliberate, and uneventful work. We like boring EVAs. But this one was different. I'm Chris Hansen of the EVA office here at NASA's Johnson Space Center and former chairman of the Mishap Investigation Board. I've been with NASA for 26 years, and over those years I've encountered some truly amazing people, experiences, scientific discoveries, and incredible stories. The story I want to share with you today is what brought me to the Mishap Investigation Board and in my opinion is one of the most important stories that NASA has to tell when we almost killed an astronaut. On July 16th, 2013, Italian astronaut Luca Parmitano and American Chris Cassidy began EVA 23 at 6.57 a.m. Uh, Chris and Luca, ready for another great EVA. Luca, you can head to uh, node one. On my way. And I'm on my way up to Petersburg. Their task that day was to connect a series of cables for a new Russian module. Relatively uninteresting work. About 40 minutes into their 10-hour workday, Luca calls down to Mission Control in Houston, Texas, and informs them that his CO2 sensor has stopped working. CO2 sensor bad alarm. CO2 sensor bad. Copy. Major 48.6. Copy that, Luca. I, uh, I got an alarm inside my helmet. Uh, I looked down, and my computer told me that there was a, there was a problem with the, with the CO2. I went through the checklist, I realized that it was a sensor failure. The ground came back and told me, yeah, we agree it's a sensor failure. Just keep monitoring your health, keep monitoring, monitoring your own performance and uh, continue with the EVA. This isn't necessarily alarming on its own. It's happened before and astronauts are trained to look for the signs of CO2 buildup in case something goes wrong. So the alarm is dismissed. But nobody predicted that it would be the harrowing symptom of a much bigger problem. Six minutes later, about 44 minutes into the EVA, Luca calls mission control again. I feel a lot of water on the back of my head. Are you sweating? Are you working hard? Um, I am sweating, but it feels like a lot of water. Hey, Luca, we copy. This is a This is highly unusual and might not seem like that big a deal until you consider the way water behaves in zero gravity. In space, Water doesn't just run down the back of your neck and soak your clothes. Instead, it sticks to your skin like gel and moves freely along the surface of your head. Hey, Luca, while you're working there, can you give us uh, maybe some more words on the water? Um, maybe identify the source, you think, and then is it getting any worse or is it the same? It's still the same, and I cannot tell you the source. I reported that I, I felt something, some water inside the helmet. But my initial thought was, this is just a nuisance. That is not something that I'm worried about. Over the next few minutes, the pooling water slowly increases in volume as Luca and the mission control team on the ground try to figure out where the water could possibly be coming from. At this point, Chris Cassidy stops working and goes over to Luca to try to help figure out what's going wrong with his suit. Oh, I see. Uh... I see it now, wiggling. Okay, Chris and Luca, you guys can just hang tight there. Chris, you can continue to help troubleshoot if need be, but uh, we're gonna talk about it here for a minute. At that call is when I had the thought of, oh, well, gosh, this is gonna take the ground team a little bit, maybe 15, 20 minutes, half hour, but that's okay because we have this half hour buffer already, so we're doing fine. 
I just don't understand where he's coming from. He can't be in the bag. In the front of the EMU, the astronauts have a drink bag full of water with a straw that allows them to drink. Luca drinks all of the water to see if it stops from entering his helmet. The bag is right now. Yeah. Bag is empty now. And uh, so there's something less than a liter in the back of his head, 800 milliliters maybe. Copy, Chris, we're talking about it. At 61 minutes into the EVA, water begins getting into Luca's ears, affecting his communication headset, instantly making a worrying situation much more difficult to resolve. Hey Chris, can you see a radio check? Radio check? Yeah, calm check. Calm check, calm check. Huh? Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if, uh, if the water is getting into my ears. Oh, yeah. Hey Luca, can you give us a status of where you think? It's not like we just heard you cannot hear. Um, is that true as well? No, 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 I can, I can hear perfectly. I can still hear perfectly, uh, but my head is really wet, and I am a feeling that it's increasing. Because astronauts spend so much time in the EMU, they wear a special garment under their suit that uses water cooling technology and wraps tubes around their body to keep them cool. So what I'm wearing is the liquid cooling ventilation garment, LCVG. We've got these uh, cooling tubes woven into the fabric throughout the whole garment. And what that does is as you work inside of the suit, you're building up a bunch of heat cold water runs through these lines and picks up the heat of your body and then once these pieces are connected the warm water after it passes through all those, those uh, lines goes back into the backpack of the suit. Luca offers that source as an explanation for the water but it is ruled out and dismissed. Right now, the flight control teams uh, have the astronauts standing by while they continue to assess the situation. Although the EVA is officially still active, the astronauts have stopped working completely. Based on what we heard with Lucas saying that uh, water is in his eyes now and it seems to be increasing, uh, we think we're going to terminate EVA case for EV2. It's important to note that the EVA has not been officially aborted. Lucas' situation is not yet considered an emergency. The most catastrophic situation is abort an EVA, and that means end everything, stop what you're doing, leave it all out how it is, and hurry as fast as you can back to the airlock, and whoever the affected person is probably is gonna need some help. Terminate the EVA, which is the situation we're in, is really defined as, hey, this is kind of trending in a direction that we're not super comfortable with, but everything is okay right now, everything is safe, we're doing fine, but we anticipate if we keep out here, it will get worse. I had Chris, my, you know, my buddy uh, outside with me, right in front of me, and I had to separate with him, uh, from him. And I had this feeling that it would have been so much better if he could just come with me. So I just thought, hey, the ground told me to go back. Chris, he isn't raising any concern. I shouldn't be concerned and I can deal with this. But I just, remember really well it's such it's a vivid image in my head that when i turn around i just i just have this feeling i just wish chris would come with me as the standard safety protocol the astronauts are tethered to the space station to keep them from floating away in the event of an accident and although chris and luca are tethered to the space station their tethers go in different directions forcing them to separate as they make their way back to the airlock and he had already started to move, and the sun had just set. Now the sun sets, Luca turns the corner, and I have this image of, imprinted in my mind of the silhouette of his spacesuit turning around the backside of the space station into the darkness, and off he goes. There's something to say about a sunset in orbit. It is not like one of those beautiful sunsets that we're used to uh, to enjoy here on Earth, where 
for several minutes you can enjoy light and, and dusk and then and the colors and all that. In orbit, it goes from pure white bright light to darkness and complete void of color in instants. The International Space Station orbits the Earth at over 17,000 miles per hour and takes about 90 minutes to go completely around it. A little less than half that time is spent on the side opposite the sun, blanketing the space station in total darkness. So as soon as I separated from Chris, I started working my way back to the airlock. At the same time, maybe because of the motion that I did in the rotation, the water that was concentrated around my forehead and around my ears instantaneously covered my eyes, it covered my nose. In that split second, I knew I was in trouble. In addition to that, Luca's comcap assembly quit functioning so he could no longer hear. So for the next five minutes, Luca was completely silent and alone. Hey, please. I hear you, Luca. Go ahead. Luca, I hear you. And I said, Hey, Chris, I'm disoriented. I, 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 need, I need some help. I hear you weak, but beatable, Luca. Can you tell okay, me where I can barely speak you? I was lost. I wasn't sure which direction to take. It's nighttime. He's on the back of the space station. He can't see. And if you let go with your hands, you are a free-floating guy in space. I couldn't even see the handholds that I was that I was supposed to hold on to in order to uh, to go back. I didn't know how much time I had before the water reached my mouth and completely drowned me. I'm opening the thermal cover. Copy, the thermal cover open. Yeah, we want to look at a hop in now. Do not connect your SCU. Chris, you will come in second and do the hatch off. Roger that. While that was happening, I was hurrying up and coiling my cable that I had to make secure and leaving it there and then going as fast as I could back on the front side of the space station uh, down to the airlock to meet him there. It's only once that Chris also enters the airlock that he's able to close the hatch and adjust his feet so he can see into Luca's helmet. The water at this point is now around his head and, uh, and entering his ear cups. All I was thinking about was closing that hatch. Okay, Shane, the hatch is closed and locked. Chris, great job. Karen, over to you. Okay, here comes the uh, equalization. Roger that. So now I'm inside the airlock. The airlock is closed in, and we are ready to repressurize. I had no way to, uh, to pressurize, to counteract the pressure on my ears. Hey, Luca from Houston, how you doing? Give us the status. While the pressure increased, the pain became really unbearable. So I started yelling as hard as I could, as loud as I could, trying to send a message to Karen that was controlling the valve to slow down the repressurization. With Luca presumably safe in the airlock, Chris's radio calls to him are all met with silence. Luca, did you hear that? Chris, speaking to him. Everything okay? You okay? You okay? Squeeze my hand if you're fine. Look. So that's when we, it just naturally, we never pre-briefed it or talked about it before or anything, but I, we just reached and grabbed each other's hand and I squeezed, he squeezed back and I knew he was fine at that moment. I'm trying to see him. He looks fine. He looks miserable, but uh, okay. Copy, that's great news. Thanks, Chris. Cash coming open. Airlock Houston, uh, if you could have some towels ready, that would be great. Once they are past the airlock and inside the space station, astronaut Karen Nyberg and two Russian cosmonauts rush to Luca's aid to help get his EMU suit off. Okay, 
In their haste, a Russian cosmonaut rushes to remove Luca's helmet and is stopped by Karen. The suits have a delta pressure in them, and if you don't first remove the glove, you run the risk of the helmet shooting straight off. Karen catches this, however, and helps Luca egress the suit properly while he towels the water that's still clinging to his face. Luca was safely inside the space station, and his close call with death opened our eyes to a real problem. I still have this image uh, of the hatch being open and seeing the faces of my crewmates inside the space station. The worry in their face, the tension uh, on their faces drew almost tears to my eyes because I realized how, uh, how important it is, how, how attached you become to your crewmates in such moments of tension. All right, nice work to you guys getting that together. It was a great team effort. Once we began our investigation, we realized how serious this problem was and began looking for answers. The week before EVA 23, Luca and Chris successfully completed EVA 22 without issue, or so we thought. We were exhilarated, we were tired, but happy. This was the completion of my first EVA. I was excited. Chris closed the hatch and we started repressurizing. After Karen took my uh, comm cap, she, she noticed that it was completely soaked. I don't think it swept. It probably got squeezed out of my drink bag. Everybody, the whole team, chalked that off um, as a normal source of, of water, nothing we need to be concerned about. Nobody investigated it, so the drink bag was swapped as a solution. What actually happened was a complex chain of scientific events, combined with human error and a lack of knowledge of this particular failure. In the suit that Luca used during this EVA, small bits of aluminum silicate plugged holes in the water separator. It's very complicated, you know, they need to part of surgery in space on the suit. Um, well, you can't really see it too well from here because it's kind of covered up. So you can kind of see it if you got it from this vantage point, you can kind of see where it is in this area right here. Um, these are normally screwed into place here, so. It's this one, right? Yes. It's this silver thing. Yep. So that whole thing interfaces to the valve module on that place. Water filters at NASA on the ground failed, allowing particulates into the suit's water filtration system while they were still on the ground. In the zero-g environment, this allowed water to flow around the fan blades and into Luca's helmet. We should have ended this EVA the moment Luca called down to mission control that he had water in his helmet, but it took us an additional 23 minutes to end this EVA for Luca's safety. So I'm thinking about the whole episode and relating that to what people do on a day-to-day -day basis, regardless of your industry or your work. Um, and that's the series of things that lead up to an event. It's human nature to see patterns and fall into a comfortable routine. We tell ourselves that if it hasn't hurt me yet, it must be fine. The natural comfort in the status quo applies to all aspects of our lives, thinking that the longer we use hardware, the better we understand it. This line of thinking tends to lead to complacency in an industry that is inherently dangerous. want to explore. It's our call. It's our destiny in a way. But we understand that anytime we go into the unknown, there are risks that are connected with taking those steps.
the evolution of space flight, or in general evolution and technology, is built on previous errors, previous failures. But we have to remember, we are still exploring, we are still running into danger, we are still dealing with the unknown, and we cannot forget that. Big shout out to Space City Films for helping us put that together. What I'd like to do now, though, is I want to walk back through. We put this timeline together. Um, at the left side of the screen here, it's called Phase Elapsed Time, PET. At zero is when the EVA starts. The spacesuit goes on uh, battery power and the crew heads outside. I want to walk through um, some of the clips and talk about them a little bit as we go. So at 38 minutes into the EVA, we saw this in the movie. Um, the first interesting thing happened. Let's see that cable routing task. I'll be routing a, an Ethernet cable. You two sensor that. Copy, Luca. Measure 48.6. Copy that, Luca. I'm with you on page 22, and Shane will join us. Okay, so I'm reading that periodical monitor physical condition, and if I notice that I'm feeling um, conditioned by the CO2, then I will help open the dome at perch and eventually terminate the VA, otherwise continue the day. So why is that important? So at 38 minutes, um, Lucas CO2 sensor gave an error that it went bad. Now, now this didn't alarm anybody. Um, and to understand why the CO2 sensor is important, you have to understand a little bit about how the suit works. So the suit is a, essentially a big balloon that the crew members inside. If we pressurize that suit up to 15 pounds per square inch, which is sort of atmospheric pressure, the crew wouldn't be able to move inside of it. It would be too difficult to work. So we have to lower that pressure significantly um, to allow them to work. So we lower that pressure down to about four pounds per square inch. Now at four pounds per square inch, you can't breathe normal air. Um, you would be unconscious uh, almost immediately and dead shortly thereafter. So you have, so we have to fill this suit up with pure oxygen. If there's pure oxygen in this suit, then you can act, then you can breathe at four psi. So we lower that suit down to four psi. Unfortunately, as the crew members breathe, they actually exhale lots of things, and one of the things they exhale is carbon dioxide, and carbon dioxide is poisonous to the system. Um, so we have to monitor the levels of carbon dioxide in the suit. And so we have a CO2 sensor inside that suit that tells us that those levels are safe for the crew members. Unfortunately, that CO2 sensor is sensitive to moisture. And at the end of a very long EVA, enough moisture can get into that system just from the crew members sweating and breathing, that, that CO2 sensor fails. And it's happened a few times, but it's always happened at the very end of a long EVA after five, six hours. It's never happened at 38 minutes into an EVA. This was the very first time. But because we were so used to seeing that CO2 sensor fail, um, when it happened, nobody made the connection at the time that the fact that it failed so early was a problem. What we, we call that normalization of deviance. We got used to that sensor failing, and therefore when it failed, even at this very unusual time, nobody connected the dots and realized that that might be a problem. In fact, it wasn't just moisture building up in the suit from normal use. The suit was actually failing at this point. And this was the first warning we got from the suit um, that something was going wrong and we missed that. So let's see at 44 minutes what came next. So I think last for you at the work site is just putting that connector in the GTEC bag and cinching it up. Roger that all in work. And Chris and Shane, if I I I feel a lot of water on the back of my head, but I don't think it's speaks from my back. 
Are you sweating? Are you working hard? Um, I am sweating, but it feels like a lot of water. It's not going anywhere. It's just in the in my sleepy cap. And hey, Luca, we copy. Hey, copy. FYI. FYI, Luca says. So clearly he's not too concerned at that point. So the first thing I gotta do is give Luca a lot of credit. Doing an EVA is the is really the pinnacle of an astronaut's experience as a crew member. Um, it's a really, really exciting uh, thing they get to do and one of the most fun things they do. This was only Luca's second EVA. So for him to point out this issue that was occurring, it took a lot. Um, I think of courage on his part to bring that up, knowing that it might be the end of his EVA if something was going wrong. So lots of credit to Luca for um, opening his mouth at that point. Five Chris, minutes this later. Is Brandon. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Brandon. So uh, while we're on that topic, we had a question um, that came into the chat um, and it was regarding the the calmness that Luca displayed during all of this. And someone actually has asked a question um, do astronauts undergo any specific kind of training for handling and managing stress, especially in life or death situations like, like this? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not a flight controller, but I know a little bit about what they do. But, but I'll say the most important thing is that when we select astronauts, they come into our um, program with lots of that training to begin with. It's one of the selection criteria. Luca himself is actually a Special Forces Air Force pilot. He's had, he, before he ever got to NASA, he had lots and lots of training of how to deal with very stressful, dangerous situations. And he demonstrated a, you know, a, a, a huge skill, a skill in, um, in being able to deal with that long before he ever came to NASA. Once he comes to NASA, our astronauts undergo lots and lots of training. We throw lots and lots of failure, practice failure scenarios at them over and over and over again. So they learn how to react very quickly to these dangerous situations without while still remaining calm. And in this case, it probably saved Luca's life as we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so let's look at 49 minutes, five minutes after Luca's first call. Let's see what happened here. Hey Luca, while you're working there, can you give us uh, maybe some more words on the water, um, maybe identify the source you think and then is it getting any worse or is it the same um good questions it feels the same uh, it's not increasing nor more i still feel it and i cannot tell you the source um my only guess is that it came out of my bag and then found its way over there in the back but I don't have any water in the front of the helmet. So a couple interesting things there. You can tell the ground control team is trying to ask Luca, hey, is your situation getting worse or not? And, and Luca's hesitant to say it's getting worse. He probably knows if he says it's getting worse, um, they're gonna send him inside. And he's trying to avoid that if it's not necessary. The second thing is it's very interesting that he's getting water on his head, on the back of his head, and his first guess as to where it's coming from is from the drink bag that's on his chest. It's hard to imagine water going from a bag on your chest to the back of your head without you noticing it. So that's really a clue um, as to one of the reasons um, why we didn't react to this perhaps as quickly as we should have. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So 11 minutes later at 55 minutes into this um, EVA, we hear this next conversation. Yeah, uh, Luca cap. I see these are sweat. No, no, it's not sweat. No, it's not sweat. Hey, Luca, can you clarify? Is it increasing or not increasing? It's hard to tell, but it feels like a lot of water. Oh, I see. Uh, I see it now, wiggling. Can you see? It's over here, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. But uh, I have um, I have that, and then there is uh. About the same amount of when I took the helmet down last time, Chris. Really? Yeah, I can feel it in the back of my head. Uh huh. I don't. I. I can. I don't understand where it's coming from. It can't be the it water. It has to be the bag. 
and you suck it dry. So in this clip, we even hear Luca's partner, uh, Chris Cassidy, saying, look, that water's got to be coming from the drink bag. And Luca, Luca gives a clue. You saw it in the movie a little bit. You know, um, it feels like about the same amount of water that was in my helmet the last time. So Luca's talking about EVA 22, which took place a week earlier. They found an, a significant amount of water in his helmet the week before. So why didn't we clue in that that was an issue? That's going to be one of the major things we talk about as we go forward. In this. Um, we heard in the movie, so I wasn't going to do this clip, Crystal, I'm not going to do this one. We heard in the movie that at this point, um, Luca does a comm check. He's getting water in his ears. He can't hear very well. It's getting worse. We just heard the flight controller. Um, that time with Shane Kimbrough, another astronaut, was talking to Luca. He's the other voice here. He asked Luca, hey, Luca, is it getting worse? Is the water increasing or is it not increasing? He's trying to get a sense from Luca. Hey, if this is getting worse, we need to bring you in. But we were still talking about it. At this point, we hadn't asked the crew members to come back inside. So at 63 minutes, we hear some of the magic words. So let's go to 63 minutes. Hey, Luca, oh, can you yeah. give us the status of where you think? It sounded like we just heard you cannot hear. Um, is that true as well? No, 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 I can, I can hear perfectly. I can still hear perfectly, uh, but my head is really wet, and I have a feeling that it's increasing. And I'm thinking that it may, I don't know if it's possible, but I'm thinking that it may be the LCBG that's leaking. Is that a possibility? So now Luca has, we heard a little bit ago, Chris said, hey, drink all the water out of your drink bag, make sure that can't be the source. So Luca drank all the water out of the drink bag, it was empty, and yet the water's still coming. So Luca knows that's not it. He's guessing that maybe it's the LCBG, you saw that in the movie, that's a good guess. There are water tubes that run up over his shoulders. If one of those was leaking, it could definitely put water in his helmet. Turns out that was not a correct guess. The problem came from somewhere else, but at that point we didn't know. Um, so even, but Luca did say the magic words. It's getting worse. I, you know, I'm getting more and more water in here. Um, we need to do something. So that leads to this call at 67 minutes, 23 minutes after his first call of water. Can you back with us? All right, Chris and Luca, just for you guys, uh, based on what we heard with Lucas saying that uh, water is in his eyes now and it seems to be increasing, uh, we think we're going to terminate EVA case for EV2. So, Luca, we'll have you head back to the airlock. Chris, we'll get a plan for you to uh, clean things up here and then join him here in a minute. So now Luca said it. He said uh, it's getting worse. Um, the ground control team decided that it was time to bring him in. Now, we didn't do an abort. If, if, there's, a, if there's a hole in, in uh, one of the crew member suits, there's an immediate risk to their life. We will abort. They'll drop whatever they're doing, race to the airlock as quick as they can and come back inside. At this point, we weren't that afraid for Luca. Um, we terminate, and in fact, we tell Chris to clean up what he's doing and meet Luca back at the airlock. Um, when Luca begins to head back to the airlock for about the next 10 minutes or so, we don't hear from him at all. Um, there's some interesting things that happened in that time frame. Um, because we don't hear from him, the ground control team, the rest of us are focused on sort of, we know the crew's coming back in, there's a lot of work to do, but we don't hear from Luca until he gets back to the airlock. His comm system is coming in now. When he gets back to the airlock at 73 minutes, this is what we hear. Okay, we're back with you, Luca. Can you give us a status? Hey, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm at the airlock. I mean, up on the, on the wing. I have a lot of water. So now back at the airlock, now you can hear it in Luca's voice that something's definitely wrong. So what happened in those 10 minutes that we didn't hear Luca? Luca talked about it a bit in the movie. When he was about halfway back to the airlock, he rotated his body in order to point himself towards the airlock. And when he did that, all of the water that was on the back of his head moved around to the front of his head and covered his eyes and covered his nose and was working its way down to his mouth. For any of you that have ever been scuba diving, you can breathe through your mouth with water in your nose, but it's very uncomfortable and it takes a lot of training. The good news is our astronauts, including Luca, are scuba trained. So that's a situation that he didn't panic, which was, a, which was very good. 
In addition to the water covering his eyes and his nose, the sun went down. When the sun goes down on the International Space Station, it is very, very dark. So Luca was completely blind. The third thing that happened is Luca's comm system completely failed. He no longer could hear his partner, he no longer could hear the ground, and he couldn't even hear himself talk through the microphone that's by his mouth. So he knew his comm system was down. So he was completely blind and he was deaf and he was alone. One of the reasons he was alone was his partner, Chris, was trying to clean up and Chris realized at that point that their tethers had been routed a different way back to the airlock. So Chris couldn't very easily at that point get to Luca to help him. So he realized the best thing he could do for Luca is to get to the airlock um, as quickly as he could. And he actually meets Luca there about the same time Luca gets there. The fourth thing that happened with Luca, and he mentions this in the movie, is that he was lost. He no longer knew which direction the airlock was. The good news is Luca was very calm. He realized he had a tether attached between himself and the airlock and he could feel it with his hands and he used that tether to guide himself back to the airlock to get to that point. Again, on the ground, we still at this point weren't too concerned about Luca's health until at 93 minutes, we hear this chat in the airlock with Chris and Luca. Thank you, Dylan. Give us the status. Luca, did you hear that? Just raise my hand if you're fine, Luca. Shane, I don't think he can. Uh, his voice is going out, or he can't hear you, but I'm trying to see him. He looks fine. He looks miserable, but uh, okay. Copy all, Chris. Uh, we'll just status you from now on to check on him. So you actually can see in that clip that um, when Chris asks Luca that question and we don't hear a response, Karen Nyberg, the astronaut inside, actually floats over and puts her hand on the manual repress valve. That is a way that she can very quickly flood the airlock with air and get Luca and Chris back inside. Unfortunately, if you do that, the pressure increases so rapidly that the crew doesn't have a chance to equalize the pressure in their ears and would most likely blow the eardrums out of both of those crew members, which is incredibly painful and would injure them. At this point, um, in order to clear the pressure in their ears, the astronauts have a, what's called a Valsalva device, which allows them to plug their nose. They press against that device. They press their nose against it. It allows them to plug their nose and equalize the pressure in their ears. Unfortunately, that Valsalva device isn't waterproof. So at this point, it was wet enough that it had actually come loose and was floating around in the helmet next to Luca's head. So he didn't have a way to repressurize his ears. So he was in a lot of pain as, as Karen was bringing the pressure up. The good news is, is before she opened that valve, she heard Chris say that Luca was okay. Um, and as you know, the rest of the story was good. We got Luca and Chris back inside. They were both healthy and fine after this. But at that point, the work um, really needed to begin on the ground um, to figure out why this happened. So let's talk about that. Let's go to the next slide. Please. Chris, yeah. real quick, uh, I have a question. Um, I'm going to put in the public chat from uh, Naya Chapman Weems uh, from University of Baltimore. She asks, uh, when an astronaut reports to Mission Control that something's wrong uh, for the first time, is there a new approach since then uh, or since this occurrence that that may help prevent situations like this from occurring again? Yeah, so we've talked, we talk about that a lot. And coming out of this mishap, we changed literally thousands of things. And one of the things that we changed is the information that the flight controllers use. Uh, occasionally we had procedures on the ground that said, hey, if the astronaut calls down this problem, have them call down to mission control and, uh, and inform us of, of of the issue and there weren't necessarily instructions with what the flight control team should do with those instructions at that point um, and some of that knowledge had been lost over the years in fact this particular failure was in there and the, the two flight controllers who actually wrote that were on my mishap board and it had been 20 years since they had written it so they weren't even sure what was in their mind when it happened so we went back through and scrubbed all of the procedures if there was ever a case where the crew was asked to call down we made sure that the instructions of what the flight control team needed to do, do next were very clear. Really not even just in the spacewalking world across all of their procedures. So we literally did hundreds of things. So that's just one uh, small example of things that we did to make this better. We really, the, the, the entire agency took the lessons learned from this very seriously and we changed lots of things to make this safer. 
So uh, I'm really proud of what the team did across really everybody's organizations. Along with your answer to go along with that, um, there someone posted that they applaud uh, NASA's transparency in the investigation and promoting the lessons learned. And they were wondering if this is something that will carry over into commercial crew. So I thought while we're while you mentioned lessons learned, um, what are the expectations for commercial crew uh, or are you aware of those uh, for for those participating in EVAs? Yeah, I hope so. Um, I'm not I don't work with the commercial crew program super closely, but what I would hope is that I can serve as an example of of, of the importance of being transparent and the importance of getting this information out. I hope that the lessons we've learned um, can help those companies be more successful. I'll give a lot of credit to SpaceX. They've had lots of issues um, learning how to do what they're doing and they have listened to um, uh, NASA a lot through the process and I think have learned um, from that and have gotten better. Uh, I think we've learned a lot from them as well. So the best thing I can say is, is I can serve as an example of, of how we should do this. Nobody likes talking about failures, nobody, including me. But I think it's really important that we do it to try to help avoid these issues in the future. So. Hopefully, hopefully they're listening and they'll learn this lesson from us. Um, Thanks, Chris. Going on. Chris. Yeah, go ahead. No, I'm saying go thank ahead, you. Man. Okay, so I think we talked about most of this. One of the really interesting things is that we found actually almost a liter and a half of water. That's that's like three of your standard water bottles that you're used to drinking. I'm looking at one now. Three of those, we found that much water in Luca's helmet at the end. Um, Luca's reaction to this, we had a question about this earlier. I think it's really important. I don't want to understate this. Luca's calm reaction to this very diff very dangerous situation absolutely saved his life. Um, he reacted in a perfect manner. Um, and I'm, I'm super glad we actually sent Luca back up uh, just uh, in the last year and he got the chance to go out and do some more EVAs for us and did a fabulous job. So his reaction was, was fabulous in this situation. So this two failure occurred um, on EVA 23. It was a shock to all of us. But the question we had to ask ourselves was, could it be have been prevented? Let's go to the next one. To ask that question, we have to go back to a week earlier. One week earlier, Luca did his very first EVA. Um, it went fine. There were uh, no issues on that. However, during repress, Luca noticed a little bit of water in his helmet. When his helmet was removed, we actually found almost half a liter of water in his helmet. There was an interesting conversation that happened. The ground control team, after this happened, asked Luca, hey, Luca, did, where, could, where did the water come from, do you think? And Luca said, well, I'm not sure, but I know I was leaning over and I was pressing on my drink bag and I saw a little bit of water come out of the drink bag, so maybe that's where it came from. So one of the ground controllers asked Luca, well, Luca, how much, how much water did you drink? Um, kind of thinking ahead of, well, we found half a liter, the drink bag holds a liter, if half of it was still in there and it leaked, maybe that could explain it. And Lucas said, well, I didn't, I didn't drink at all. You didn't drink at all. Oh my gosh, that's not good. So the first thing is that Lucas flight docs probably fussed at him. But what you have to know about Luca, Luca's a world-class athlete. He's a world-class triathlete. He understands the importance of drinking water. He also speaks English really well, but he's got a little bit of an accent. And what Luca actually said when he answered that question was, I didn't drink it all. That means something very different. So what Luke was saying was, I didn't drink all of the water, so there was some in there, so maybe that's what it was. That was enough confusion between the ground controllers that were hearing this and Luca that we just assumed that the drink bag was the source of the water. We didn't actually check. Um, so all we did is on the EVA the next week, we changed the drink bag out and we went out the door. We actually checked both of those drink bags, the one from EVA 22 and EVA 23, after this event, and neither one of them were leaking. It's important to note that to check those drink bags took very little time. It would have been a very easy thing for us to do had we figured out that that's what we should have done. That's, a, that's an important lesson we'll talk about coming up here in a second. Let's go to the next slide. So what were the causes of this mishap? We're gonna talk a little bit about um, physically what happened in the suit. There were some inorganic materials um, we called, uh, you heard in the movie, we talked about aluminum silicate that caused blockage inside a very complicated piece of hardware. I'll show you some pictures of it um, called the, the fan pump separator. And that resulted in water spilling over from the, from the cooling loop into the vent loop and uh, worked its way up to Lucas helmet. Our lack of knowledge regarding this particular failure mode 
we knew that this failure was possible. It manifested itself in a way none of us had ever considered. And in addition, obviously, we talked about this. We misdiagnosed the suit failure when it initially occurred on EVA 22. So let's talk about some of these in a little more detail. Next slide. And next. And one more. First of all, program emphasis was to maximize crew time on orbit for utilization, which means doing science. And I'm not really poking at the program managers here because they're in charge of that. The space station is a $100 billion scientific laboratory. And with only a limited number of crew on board, there's not a lot of time. And we built that for science. We need to spend as much time doing science as possible. But the program managers have all the information in their head from all the folks that work for them about what issues are happening. And they use those to do a risk trade to decide when they need to do other things, um, things other than science. And because of that, a lot of times when our flight control teams or engineers would ask for other things to be done to check on things, the program managers uh, made the decision that it was less important to do those things. And that was the right call because they, they understood everything that was going on across the space station and they made the proper risk trade. However, it happened so often that some of our engineering team and flight control teams hesitated to ask because they knew they would be told no. There were people on the ground that asked the question, hey, how do we know the drink bag didn't leak? Um, I'm not gonna go ask the program manager to go, to go check because I think it might be a waste of time and we got a lot of work to do. And it wasn't incompetence that they did that. Um, we, are, we have a very difficult, complicated job to do, and we, and we make assumptions about what we think we know and what we actually know. And we'll talk about that in lessons learned. So that emphasis to, to be so focused on utilization without stop stepping back and talking to our teams about the importance of bringing up questions and concerns um, helped lead to this, we believe. Next. There was also a perception that the drink bags leaked. We've had, and that's because we've had a history of drink bags leaking in the space program, but not this drink bag. This drink bag had never had a leak. But because we were so used to drink bags having failed, when our teams were told that, hey, the, the drink bag leaked, they were told it like it was a fact, the drink bag leaked, we're gonna replace it, everybody accepted it. Next slide. The, the flight control team's perception of the anomaly reporting process as being resource intensive made them reluctant to invoke it. This is a human nature thing that's really tough. Our um, anomaly reporting processes um, are resource intensive for a reason. We have very complex systems and when things go wrong, we need to keep track of those so when they repeat themselves, we have information and data. Unfortunately, sometimes we make it difficult um, to actually do the day-to-day -day jobs that we need to do. So we have to find a way to balance how complex these systems are, how much work they add to it, against the risk of not using them properly. That's a really tough one. We don't have a great answer for that one, but it's something we need to be conscious of as we go through the system. Next slide. No one applied the knowledge of physics of water behavior to, in zero G to water coming from the Puss vent loop. We know how water behaves in space, but when you put water in a very complex complex situation like this, it behaves in ways we didn't expect. We knew this failure could happen. If it did happen, we what we thought would happen was that the water would pool, it would stop the fan from moving, it would shut the fan pump separator down, and it would prevent water from moving into the helmet. In zero gravity, that didn't happen. We just missed the time. Next slide. And the occurrence of minor amounts of water in the helmet were normalized. You think doing a spacewalk, man, having water in your helmet, as soon as Luca reported he had water in his helmet, you would think that we would just send him inside immediately. Unfortunately, we have a suit that has a sublimator on it, which is a device that helps take moisture out of the system, that at the end of a long EVA, it can let small amounts of water past it and get into the helmet. Had never caused a problem in the past. It was just kind of a nuisance, and but it got used to trained all of us to getting comfortable that water in your helmet during an EVA is kind of a normal thing. I think that really contributed to how slowly we sort of reacted to this, this new situation where we were getting more and more water in the helmet. Next slide. I want to leave time for question and answer, so I'm going to zip through some of these last ones. One of the other interesting things is we can't, there's a lot of times when we have a mishap, we just shut down the system and make sure we're not going to do anything until we can guarantee that it's safe. Unfortunately, the International Space Station can't stop flying, and there are lots of failures that can happen that will that will essentially lead to the potential loss of space station. And we have to go out and do a spacewalk to fix those things. 
Unfortunately, we had three of those EVAs occur in the middle of our investigation where we had, before we knew what happened, we had to send the crew out to fix it. To do that, we put a lot of things in place to help them. We put a snorkel in the suit that we built on orbit. Um, we, gave, we taught them some hand signals to make sure that they could communicate with each other if they lost calm, and a bunch of other things that we did. We worked very closely, our mishap team worked very closely with the program um, to put those things in place so that we could go do those safe walks as, as safely as we could, and, and we did that. Next slide. So what happened to the suit? It's very interesting, and it's a long chain of events. Um, what you see in the lower right here is called a water separator drum. That drum spins at about 19,000 revolutions per minute. And water has to flow through those little bitty holes you see on it that are about 20 thousandths of an inch in diameter. Um, you see when we pulled the fan pump separator out, when we looked inside of it, what we saw was what you see in the upper right hand corner there, which was some de debris in all of those holes. It turns out that that debris was aluminum silicate, which confused us at the time because there shouldn't have been any of that inside the suit. So where did it come from? Let's go to the next slide. Where it came from, if we go all the way back to the Columbia accident uh, back in the early 2000s, um, the suit sat on orbit. We didn't fly. Um, we didn't do spacewalks for a couple of years. The suit sat on orbit um, quiescent, meaning we weren't using them for quite a bit of time. So the first time we plugged them in and turned them on, we actually damaged those suits. Debris corrosion had built up inside of the systems in the heat exchanger that they were hooked to. That debris went downstream and clogged the pump. So we knew that we needed to do a better job keeping those systems clean. So we built um, a filter. We built two filters. You see them in this picture here. The green blobby thing on the bottom is a, a particulate filter that keeps the big chunks out. And right upstream of that is an ionic filter that takes out the contamination in the water that protects our suit. So being the good engineers that we were, we built those systems, we put them in, and every 90 days we scrub our suits on orbit to keep them clean. Next slide. Unfortunately, we needed some of those filters in the middle of this um, event when we were investigating. We built some of those filters, we put them on the shelf, and when we went back to get them, we noticed there were holes in them. They were actually corroding, having only sat on the shelf for a couple of years, for a couple of weeks, we were already seeing corrosion. And it turns out there's a couple things that happened. It turns out we built these filters out of some lower quality Italian steel. I blame Luca for that one. Um, it was a good thing we did actually though, because it turns out that as we build these filters, we were supposed to pump clean deionized water through them. And then we fly them up to space station. What we found in these filters was very dirty water. It turns out it was Houston city water and I, you don't wanna know what's in Houston city water. We ran, because of some failures in our water filtration systems in a couple of locations, we actually ran dirty water through this filter. Um, the filter probably did a great job cleaning that water. Unfortunately, it left all of that contaminant inside the filter. We then flew those filters up to the International Space Station, hooked them up to our very um, expensive suits, and we damaged them and caused this failure. So there were lots of places that we could have prevented that on the ground. We've put in lots of, again, procedures to make sure this doesn't ever happen again across the entire agency, not just in the EVA. Next slide. So I want to talk a little bit about lessons learned. One of the things is this suit was designed in the late 70s and was certified for a single shuttle mission back in 1982. By 1995, we knew we were going to be building a space station and we weren't going to be able to fly suits up and down as much. So we recertified those suits for 25 EVAs. And then eventually we extended that certification out to one year, two years, three years, and now the suits stay on orbit for six years. The problem with that is you have to understand when you build a system and then you use it in a way that's different than it was designed for or different than the people who designed it assumed it would be living in, um, you have to understand those differences. If you know anything about space station, the water systems on board the space stations are extremely dynamic. We found lots of chemicals in them at different times through our history. Uh, it's been complicated to keep the water clean and figure out where the contaminants are coming from. The suit has been sent to contaminated water um, over the years, and the suit wasn't designed for it. Initially. So that's one of the lessons learned is if you take a system you've designed and you use it in ways it wasn't intended, you have to make sure you understand what those things Next slide, so let's talk some lessons learned. I'm gonna hit these at a high level. The first thing, it's human nature. We want patterns and structure, but this tendency can lead to the belief that something that's been okay before will remain so. I used to say, I used to say when I give this presentation that people are inherently lazy. I had a social, social psychologist correct me and say, people aren't lazy, they're efficient. 
They're continually striving for efficiency by looking for patterns and simple things. Be careful that you're not making assumptions that just because something's worked the same way in the past, it will continue to do so. Next slide. We'll never know everything. These systems are so complicated. There's no single person that understands how they work. But the more, the more we use those systems successfully, we start to believe that we know more about them than we actually do. We don't. Next slide. Don't assume something's safe because we've done it before. Next slide. Stay hungry and visual and ask questions. This one's important to me. Um, we talk about diversity, and I think NASA does a very good job with diversity. But when we talk diversity, we, we generally talk about gender diversity and racial diversity. And those things are really important. But what I want to really focus on here is cognitive diversity. Diversity in the way we think. When you take people from different backgrounds, different ways of thinking, different schools, different um, educations, and you put them together, magical things happen. You solve very difficult problems incredibly more efficiently. We pulled engineers onto our mishap team that didn't know anything about spacesuits, but they were smart engineers. Very quickly, they started getting into asking questions that we didn't know answers to. Diversity is really, really important. Stay hungry, vigilant, ask lots of questions. Next slide. Um, gaps in data and theories present risk. As engineers, we never have all the data that we want to have. Um, so you have to understand, if, if I make assumptions and fill in those gaps in data and information, I have to understand what are the consequences if I'm wrong. Next slide. Um, this one hurts me a little bit. Anyone in any organization could have prevented this, this mishap by asking a very simple question. How do you know the drink bag leaked? Nobody could have answered that question. Um, and had somebody asked that question, it likely would have led us down the path of doing a very quick check, and we would have realized that the drink bag on EVA 22 didn't leak, and then we would have investigated this, and we never would have sent um, Luca out the door. When you, as a young person, when you walk into a situation, into a new company, into a new business, whatever you're doing, don't be afraid to ask questions. And as leaders in your organization, encourage people to ask questions questions. There really are no stupid questions. I know that's a bit of a cliche. It's true though. Anybody could have stopped this mishap with a very simple question. Next slide. These last ones I'm going to go through fast because this was, I kind of stole these from Wayne Hale. Wayne Hale was a longtime NASA flight director who lived through the Challenger and Columbia accidents. He gives a presentation. I put these in here because it strikes me that his main lessons learned applied to this event as well. So we have to find a way to start um, learning these lessons and remembering them. And I want you to do that by remembering that Luca was the one in that suit. Luca is the one we almost killed. Every time we're in these situations, it's somebody um, who's loved and who has a family and who cares about them. And it is your responsibility to make sure those people stay safe. It can happen to you. Nobody is smart enough to avoid all problems. I love this quote. A preoccupation with failure results in high reliability organizations. You have to be preoccupied with failure, the things that can go wrong, and think about how to prevent those things. Next slide. Focus. Um, aviation in, it, in itself is not inherently dangerous, but terribly unforgiving of carelessness, incapacity, or neglect. I'm not poking at any of our teams. This NASA team, I'm gonna tell you right now, is the best in the world at what they do. From the engineering teams, to the flight controllers, to the safety team, they are the best at, at what they do in the world. However, they're human. We're all human. And, and the humans in our system are the biggest strength as well as the biggest weakness. We have to work hard to overcome our natural tendencies. Next slide. You're not nearly as smart as you think you are. Listen, ask questions. Next slide. This is my favorite quote. I have three daughters, um, so I've spent my life trying to make sure they understand this. People in groups tend to agree on courses of action, which as individuals, they know are stupid. Um, it happens all the time. Don't be afraid to go against the trend, to raise your question. Don't just look around the room, and if everybody's nodding and you don't understand why, don't be afraid to ask a question why. Next slide. Use your imagination. The Apollo 1 fire was referred to by Frank Borman as a failure of imagination. They couldn't imagine a ground test that could be hazardous or could be that hazardous. Keep vigilant and have an active imagination of all the possible hazards. It's really important. Next slide. 
So in conclusion, NASA considered this close call a very an extremely serious wake up call. They took action. I was proud of this agency. They gave me all the tools I needed. They took all of my recommendations, all of our team's recommendations uh, seriously and enacted all of them. As individuals, you also have to take action to prevent future similar mishaps. It is your responsibility to try to prevent these kinds of mishaps. ISS has a long successful history. Uh, our space suit program has a long successful history. We can't rest on our laurels and assume that because of that, nothing can go wrong. We can't let our program's successes lead us um, into assuming that we have all of the answers for the future. We don't. We have to stay vigilant. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for listening. We are going to answer some questions at this point. But I'll take yeah. I think Brandon is yeah. Yes, Chris, we actually have uh, several questions. Um, sure. The first one i uh, go to is uh, wondering why Luca wasn't able to drink the excess water um, once it covered the eyes and nose. and um, they mentioned risk trade suggesting better to 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 dr not drown than than drink the water, but there are reasons why he wouldn't be able to do that. So, could you yeah. So remember, that? yeah, that's a good question. And, and Luke actually did drink some of the water. He he mentioned later that it tasted um, really funny. In addition, he remembered later that the water was cold. That would have been a very interesting clue that would have told us immediately it wasn't from the drink bag probably wasn't from the LCVG. If that water's cold, it's likely coming right out of the portable life support system, which is where it came from. It also has iodine in it, so it tastes bad. He remembers that taste in his mouth later. Um, so he did actually drink it. The problem is you gotta remember his hands were tied behind his back and the water was sticking to different parts. It's not as easy just to get to all of it. He didn't have a cup sitting in front of him that he could take all the water. He drank some of the water that he, would, he could get to, um, but you got to remember, being inside of a spacesuit, it's incredibly claustrophobic, and your hands are effectively tied behind your back. So that's a really difficult thing to do. Next. Yep. And so, um, Carrie from Georgia Tech says, while 1.4 liters certainly seems like a lot, is that a considerable amount in comparison to how much is contained in the cooling component? Or was it uh, this was considered a significant leak? You know, so in terms of how much water is in the suit, I forget the exact number, um, but, it, but the suit itself has significantly more cooling water in it than that. But you got to remember what made this so much water is the fact that it, it was in the helmet all of, from his neck and up. A liter and a half of water in that very small confined space is an enormous amount of water for him to deal with um, inside the suit. In terms of total water inside the system, um, there's quite a bit more water in it than that. At some point, though, and now we would have never let it get that far. We would shut the, you shut the fan pump separator off. The water will keep going. Uh, will will stop flowing into his helmet. So we're smarter today about how we would deal with this. We never let that much water get in there. We have a way to stop it. We just didn't know that we needed to at that point. You mentioned the uh, CO2 sensors in the suit. Is that something that's replaceable on orbit? Um, it is. We can replace the, the CO2 sensors. The thing is, though, when they fail that way, it's only temporary. We just have to dry them out. So when we have failures of those CO2 sensors, uh, we just run air through them um, and it dries them out and they continue to function. It doesn't damage the sensors. It just keeps them from functioning while they're wet. Um, we're dealing with that on our new spacesuit today. Turns out there aren't a lot of CO2 sensors out there in existence that aren't sensitive to water. Um, so we're, we're struggling with that on our new suit. We have some designs that we think help prevent that. But it didn't damage the sensor, just quits functioning while it's wet. That's great. That leads right into this next question. Um, Celian is from uh, is a junior in high school in Katy, Texas, and was wondering how this failure is taken into consideration when designing the Artemis suit. Yeah, all right, go Katy Tigers. Um, we're nearby teams. Um, we've actually taken a lot of lessons. So we've had failures over the years with the EMU, the suit we use today. We've taken a lot of those failures into consideration in the new, the next generation suit that we are building here at JSC right now. We have technicians that are assembling the next generation suit as we speak. And one of the big things that change is the vent loop and the cooling loop where there's water and oxygen. They don't cross in the new suit. There's no physical connection between those two like there is in the current EMU. So we've prevented, really, we prevented the capability of water from getting into the vent loop in the new suit. That's one example. We've We've done other things as well, but that's one of the main ones that we've learned from this suit that we want those two things to be separate inside the suit. All right. And um, I have another student from University of Baltimore that says, if for some reason the connection were lost from Luca to the base, how would 
uh, to, to Mission Control. Um, how would the crew and astronauts be prepared to take on such a situation? Are there guidelines or emergency plans documented for that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's lots of procedures in place. If the crew uh, loses all communication, they are fully capable of getting back inside the airlock without any help from the ground. They are trained for that. They're trained if they lose all communication. Um, the suit itself is actually designed to, if it has a complete failure, um, and, uh, electrical failure, the suit is fail safe, which means they'll have enough oxygen to get back in the system. So they don't need the ground team to get back in. They've got everything they need on board. The commander of a given spacewalk, in this case it was Chris Cassidy, has all the authority he needs to make decisions to keep them safe, whether the ground is in communication with them or not. So they're absolutely trained for that situation. And just as a comment, one of the suits team students, uh, Christine, says a uh, situation where Luca can't see where he's going seems like a perfect example when an auditory guidance navigation system would be useful, like something designed by suits teams. Yep, that's a great point, and we're looking at those things. I'm a huge fan of my Alexa, and so we're trying to figure out um, sort of how what we're interested in is what kind of communication are the astronauts in a suit comfortable talking to their suit and having to talk back to them? Seems like a simple uh, question, um, but we're doing some studies, including your suits teams are helping us with that, trying to decide what sort of information like that would be helpful to an astronaut in these kinds of situations. So as you mentioned earlier, Luca had, had a lot of training about remaining calm and co cool and collected in these types of situations. And someone, um, I guess, followed up on that. Uh, Philip says, uh, mentioning that his reaction saved his life. Um, is there something EVA team has worked on to make sure that continues and, uh, and doesn't get in the way of uh, communicating the urgency of a situation? It seemed like Chris jumped right in there uh, to like squeeze his hand, but are there other um, procedures that have come up as a result? Yeah, really, I'm only scratching the surface. The flight control team has done an amazing job going back and looking at, I mean, really, I'm talking about the just the EVA world. That team has gone back and done an amazing job looking at all of the procedures and processes and the potential failures that can happen and how we would react to them. Um, so they've done a lot of that work. In addition, we were asked by Bill Gerstlemeyer to expand this into other areas that are dynamic. There are other situations on space station when we have vehicles docking, coming in and away from space station where there are hazards that can get to you quickly. And we looked at the lessons learned from this mishap and applied them to those other situations uh, as well. So we've tried to take this and expand it across all of our operations in human spaceflight to try to learn from it and get better. That's great. Uh, this one I wanna read mainly because Morgan says, I'm 12 years old and I want to be an astronaut. My question is when Luca had his first had his first EVA and there was water in the helmet, uh, did it not concern the team? Why did it not concern the team if the drink back is on the front? So I know you've kind of talked a little bit about that, but Morgan's asking the question. Yeah, that's a good question, Morgan. And I think we touched a little bit on that. Um, the biggest issue is that not very many people knew. Um, not, not too many people knew that Luca had water in his helmet at that point. It was limited in the number of people um, that were aware of it. And because um, we weren't as concerned about it as we should have been, we didn't talk to enough people. That gets back to my comment that, look, when these things happen, we need to talk to people and we need to share that information with people. Um, I'm going to go back. You didn't ask this question, Morgan, but you want to be an astronaut. So I want to give a plug um, for uh, what can you do to become an astronaut? And let me tell you, I'm going to give a plug to STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. We need lots of scientists and engineers and math people in this business. Study those things, work hard, find a job you love doing, um, and then it won't matter if you become an astronaut. Um, you'll be happy, you'll love the job you're doing, but we'll also improve your chances of getting in the astronaut program and coming and joining us when you get a little bit older. And that was actually one of the next questions uh, from someone else. What educational path or background do you need to be an, an astronaut or an EVA person? And I would echo what you said. Find something you love to do. Um, so thanks for that answer. Yeah, I'll say, let me add too, in science, technology, engineering, and math are really important. I'd say most of our astronauts come. Ricky Arnold's one of my favorite astronauts. He's a, he's a teacher. Um, he grew up as a teacher. So there's lots of different ways um, into the program. We, we really look for people 
who are really dedicated to the work they do and who um, have, have been successful at things they do and who love the work that they do, uh, like we said, right? So that's the real key is find something you love to do and be good at it. Uh, another question from Brian. How was the threat of electrical shock avoided? Was there ever a threat of electrical shock? No, in this case, because we know inside the spacesuit you can get water for lots of reasons. The crew's sweating. They're working really hard in these suits. We can get water in those suits. So we make very sure that all of the potential electrical connections inside that suit are protected very, very carefully. So we don't let anything, um, any electrical kind of connections inside that suit uh, in, in a way that will allow them to touch water and cause potential shorts. We're very, very careful about that particular problem. Because we always, because even in a normal situation, you can get some amount of water inside these spaces. People are in there. People are messy. Um, Chris Ryan uh, says, have there been similar in instances like this or have there been situations where uh, an EVA had to be aborted? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we've had EVAs that have had to be terminated. Um, we had an EVA that Chris was actually involved in that his CO2 levels were going up high. The suit wasn't working quite the way it should have. Um, we asked Chris to come back inside. He was fine. We had another time where our cooling system had been contaminated. So a quick cooling to the level um, that, we, that we wanted to. So we had that crew member come back inside. So we've terminated a few EVAs for different technical issues. It's always been done safely. I'm not aware of any situation where we've aborted an EVA with, uh, with uh, under an emergency situation. Um, someone had a follow-up question on, on the failure, um, how the clogging actually caused the failure uh, and water redirection. Is there a full accident report that folks could look at with details online with actual hardware? Yeah, you can Google it. So the mishap report is um, on here. You can kind of see it on the bottom there of your screen. The report itself for the public version, um, most of the technical details of how the suit works have been redacted out. You have to control some of that stuff. Um, so it's a little complicated to explain, but fundamentally there's a place inside this fan pump separator where water and air kind of cross paths. And as long as everything works fine, there's no issue. If those holes get clogged, it can allow water to spill over into the vent loop. Without drawing some pictures for you, it's hard for me to explain that any deeper than that. If you dig through the internet, you can probably find some good details on what happened. This, this event was pretty well covered in the press. Um, I think you've pretty much given it with the lessons learned, but someone's asked about organizational fail safes um, that are in place now to prevent events like this that may occur due to normalization of deviance in operations and devices. Um, Anything you want to say on that? Yeah, I'll give you, again, um, there's two keys to it. And one of them is what I'm doing right here, and that is talking about this. So we talk about these things internally in NASA. We address these things as much as we can. Our program managers really learned a good lesson out of this as well, that they need to reinforce to the people that work for them that it's important to raise issues, raise concerns, ask questions if you have them. Um, so again, I think this comes down to, I asked during, during the failure investigation, I asked some people who do failure investigations for a living, what's the secret? How do we stop these human failures in these systems? And none of them had a great answer for me, other than we have to personalize these issues, make people understand what's at stake and keep talking about them. So we actually do a lot of training. We spend a lot of time talking about these very things to try to remind us continually um, how important it is for us to keep our focus on these potential things that can go wrong. All right. Um, one of the um, participants says, what change has been made to encourage diversity in questions and ideas? It's one thing to have a team of diverse backgrounds, um, but a different thing to encourage voices to speak out and be actually heard. What are your thoughts on that, Chris? Yeah, that's a good, I mean, that's a good question. Um, again, like I said, NASA is really good about diversity. If you look across our intern programs, um, across the people we hire, we, we hire people from lots of different backgrounds and cultures and genders. And, we ha and, and I, so NASA kind of encourages that diversity. But, but you're talking about something a little, part of your question was a little more subtle than that. As leaders, we have to encourage and reward people for raising their hand and asking questions. Um, we get so focused on doing our jobs 
And, and for those of us that have been in the business for a long time, I've been doing this for 30 years, it's easy to forget what it was like when you were a first year um, employee or in your first few years, how stressful it is asking questions of people that have been around for a long time and you assume are way smarter than you. Um, I think the key is that as leaders, we have to encourage that among the people that work for us. And this is true in any industry. Encourage people to ask questions and reward them for it. Don't punish people. Don't punish our young people for asking good questions and challenging us um, when they think we're not always wrong, but sometimes we are. This is a great example. This, this mishap was a great example where lots of us were wrong about lots of things. So it's important, I think, as leaders to set that tone, to ask questions, to, uh, for the young people to ask questions. Chris, you mentioned the new suits with Artemis. Uh, and the ways they're being designed, and these all of these events uh, t being taken into into um, into those situations of redesign. But have there been any updates to the suit, uh, the current suits since this incident? Yeah, we've done we've done several things in terms of directly reacting to this. So the snorkel that we talked about, we keep those in the suit because it's kind of out of the way and it's an easy thing. Um, there's a, what's called a helmet absorption pad that we put in the back of the, the helmet that allows the crew member, it does two things. It, it allows the crew members, if water ends up pooling anywhere on their head, they can actually get it off by pressing against it. It also turns out it's a pretty good early warning system um, in terms of um, if they feel water in that, if it gets squishy, they, they can tell what more water is getting up there than is, is healthy for them. So it gives us kind of an early warning system. Um, we fly something called EDAR, which is a high telemetry data system, data system on the suit. In the past, we've never been able to get much um, data off the suit. We get one data take every two minutes. Um, now we actually get real-time high-rate data on the suits that gives us a lot more insight into how the suit is working while the crew members are out doing spacewalk. Um, that's a fairly new system that we haven't had in the past. So there's other things we did, but those are a few, few changes. That we did. A couple of great questions here. Um, one says you mentioned the nose piece used to help astronauts neutralize the pressure in the ears was not waterproof. Has that design been changed in any way? Um, not really, because because really what we want to focus on is keeping water from getting in the helmet. So we've done lots of things to keep that from happening. Um, so rather than redesign that particular part of the system, we've changed other things in the system to make sure that that's not a problem. Those so also and, devices work really well, so we kind of like them the way they are. And Stephen from Kennesaw State says, uh, you mentioned the iodine in the water leaking into the suit. Is there a method used to identify different liquids or a thought to do that uh, if they leaked in the suit, like a color, for example? Uh, we've talked about that. And one of the things um, that we've thought about is, is again, we noticed if, Lu if Luca had told us that the water tasted funny or that um, the water was cold, that gives us some clues. The problem is that this particular suit design, and it's one of the things we've changed in the new one, this particular suit design is incredibly sensitive to contamination in the water. So we have to be really careful with what we put in that water. And so we don't want to put anything in there that's going to jeopardize the functioning of the suit. One of the things we've changed in the new suit is that the cooling systems that we use are significantly more robust and less sensitive to contamination. We've done lots of things. That's one uh, we think we tackled pretty well in the news. Great. Um, obviously, there's so many more questions than we actually have time to answer, but uh, with only a couple minutes left, I wanted to uh, make sure that we, we thank Chris for his time with us, uh, taking out 90 minutes of the day to, to speak to all of us. We really do appreciate that. And we also appreciate all of you who have joined us on the line um, for this event. This is the first time for many things uh, in hosting an event like this. And uh, we really appreciate you uh, for joining us. Chris, do you have any parting words? Yeah, I just wanna say thank you, Brandon, for um, inviting me. And again, I want to leave you the thought I started with, particularly for the young engineers out there. People's lives depend on what you're doing. Focus on them. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Raise your hand. Don't be afraid to listen to people with backgrounds than you, different cultures than you. There's a lot that we have to teach each other. There's a lot we can learn from each other. And after that, let's go to the moon and 
uh, we're, we're excited to go back and walk on the moon. So and then on to Mars. So thanks again, Brandon, for having me. Absolutely. And Crystal, if you could put, um, or maybe someone can put in the chat, if you'd like to post your uh, questions that you continue to have, you can uh, hashtag NASA suits um, and we will try to get to those questions, uh, answer them if we can. Um, then you may also um, put on your comments about this event. Uh, again, hashtag NASA suits and at NASA STEM. Crystal, you want to close it out? Sure, no problem, Brandon. Uh, we're back and I just want to say thanks for everyone for joining and um, look at also nasa.gov um, in the STEM engagement section um, for opportunities for challenges um, just like NASA suits. Uh, and we hope that you uh, apply uh, for NASA suits also in recruitment um, if you haven't already. Um, we'll start uh, recruiting again in the fall. So thanks for joining. Bye.